please uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Tierney on my left, uh, Robin Adcock here in the center, Dr. David E. Smith, and moderator Pamela Olton. Thank you. So we have uh, two elders who are masters in their fields, and we have a new younger pioneer who's building new pathways for us, which I'm so excited to hear about. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Pam. I'll start off. It is very exciting to be here now when we're the center of the spiritual movement and resistance. I mention that because when I first started in the addiction field, addiction was a crime. Doctors that treated addiction were guilty of aiding and abetting a, cr a, a crime. And they, we actually were subject to arrest in 1967. But how can you arrest 100,000 middle-class kids in the hate? So that was the beginnings of the field of addiction medicine. That got a great deal of publicity. Uh, this was the center of the uh, drug movement. But as it relates to this topic, we're in the midst of the biggest drug epidemic in U.S. history. The 60s got a, most of the publicity. It's far worse now. In rare bipartisan accord, U.S. Congress passed new legislation to address the opiate epidemic as a continuation bill for the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act that was signed into the law by President Obama in 2016. The Opiate Crisis Response Act now goes by the Substance Abuse Disorder Prevention that promotes opiate recovery and treatment for patients and communities. Support for this provides funding and it will be crucial for those involved with acupuncture to mainstream into these types of initiatives because this is where the funding is going to come from. There is a very bright future for acupuncturists to integrate into the mainstream medical system, but you have to be aware of the overall situation the overall funding opportunities and, and the uh, imp implementation. And I talked a lot with Pam on making sure those doors are, doors are open. Thank you, David. Um, Ra, would you like to give some opening remarks and a little bit about your background before we start? Sure, okay. sure. So I'm kind of the new kid on the block. And when I agreed to do this, I had no idea the company I would be sitting in up here. So it's quite an honor. Um, I've been licensed for just two years, so as an acupuncturist, I've been doing, um, providing healthcare as a massage therapist, cranial sacral therapist for about 20. Um, so, uh, but in the world of acupuncture in that profession, I'm about four years in uh, and two years licensed, so six years total of training and working. And um, my work focuses less on addiction per se, but a lot on pain. And my interest is... Uh, how to make acupuncture available in a much broader scale. I want to see my fellow acupuncturists making a really good living doing this beautiful medicine. Um, I think we've come a long way in trying to convince people that our modality is effective. And I think the word is out there now about it. And now we have work to convince people that we're the practitioners to continue to deliver that. And um, so that's why I uh, have focused my work at UCSF and with uh, CSOMA because that allows me the chance to create programs in a hospital that hopefully can be replicated in hospitals across the country, uh, which would open up a tremendous amount of work for our profession and really elevate patient care. Um, and then I put a lot of energy, a little bit of paid time and a lot of volunteer time into CSOMA because that's where I can deliver a message, hear from the profession, integrate and interact with other state associations and, um, and work on lobbying efforts because unfortunately we can't just be clinicians. Uh, we also have to do political work and have to understand how the system works and insurance to make sure that we're able to bring our medicine to the table. So it's not my favorite work, and it's certainly not my biggest strength, but um, I'm really dedicated to do it on behalf of the profession because one without the other, uh, we're going to fall short. So what I'm hoping to do is to try and understand through UCSF, I'm onboarding right now. I've been there for, um, I've been doing things on and off with UCSF for six years. I'll get more into that. But what I'm trying to understand is how do I create programs there um, 
how do we dovetail with the existing systems that are there? And I, I promise you, we can come in so seamlessly. I'm seeing it happen, how easily we mold into the lattice of what's there. And, um, and then how to create programs that are sustainable. And that's going to come back to insurance and things like that. We'll talk more about that. But I'm really looking to create sustainable programs that can be replicated. And that's why I also have my hand in research, because research is the language of medicine. And we have to participate at that level to be able to uh, prove our efficacy and make a case for why we need to be incorporated. Thank you so much. Stephen, a few opening remarks telling us about the work you've done in addiction psychology. Um, so my name is Stephen. I'm an addict and an alcoholic. I have been clean and sober for 23 years. Um, and the primary way that I support that um, lifestyle is through a group called Meditation and Recovery, which happens every Monday and Friday night. Um, we draw about 150 people a week at the Zen Center and at Hartford Street Zen Center on Fridays. Open meetings if you're interested in the combination of recovery and um, mindfulness. You feel free to come by or talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you about it. Um, but I, my belief is I've, I've been lucky enough to teach at ACTCM in the master's and doctoral programs for about 12 years now, on and off. I'm currently off because I'm pretending to be retired, as you can see. Um, but the combination um, of various practices is what's really important. What we know is that we will never medicate or we will never treat ourselves out of the drug crisis in America. Never. Um, because it continues to evolve. We were talking earlier when we were <clears throat> uh, relaxing about when crystal meth became the predominant concern of everybody um, at the end of the predominant concern being crack cocaine. Um, and as we all sitting in this room know that all three of those things are still threats to various communities um, in which they land. So the deal is that we need to figure out it's not a particular drug. If it was just the drug or just the behavior, um, we would all, everybody who eats would be a food addict. Show of hands, how many of you ate anything, knowing all of your concern and care about yourself, how many of you ate anything in the last week that you shouldn't have eaten? Mm -hmm. And how many of you will eat it again in the next two weeks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're all addicts. Welcome to the group. Um, and if that, if it was as simple as that, um, you know, we could, we could go substance by substance. But from the beginning of recorded time, people have used substances um, and behaviors um, for healing, soothing, and pleasure, right? And so what we need to do is we need to get to the point where we're beginning to look um, at why people are using those substances. Um, we live in a country that's really confused about something as simple as pleasure. We hear lots of talk about ending desire and the problem of desire. Not true. What we need to do is help people feel good about pleasure without shame. Um, because that, particularly for the adolescents that I worked with, is a huge, uh, is a huge trigger for needing to be soothed and healed. Um, and then we know, um, and we'll talk about the numbers more later probably, but in the United States in the last 10, in the last five years, the number of emergency room visits for um, opioid-related um, addictions went from 400,000 to a million two. So um, there is not enough medical doctors or nurses or acupuncturists or therapists to treat that. So what we have to do is continue to do that emergency work of keeping people alive, um, getting everybody equipped with the, with the medications they need to keep people alive on an emergency basis. But we need to go back before that and figure out how we retool our schools and our criminal justice system and our families um, to really raise children um, that feel loved and feel connected and feel like they have a place to go um, when life is not going well. So we have, in the work that I do now, um, I have a private practice um, downtown and I do mindfulness-based and Buddhist-based psychotherapy. Um, and I work a lot with folks who, my specialty is relapse prevention, a word I'd like to get rid of, but for now that's what people know to call it. Um, and my first question when I talk to folks that I work with is, they come to me and say, I, I had a relapse last week, um, I used crystal meth or I used heroin. Um, and we sit and talk and we get quiet, and I say to them, no, no, that's not what happened. You had a, you had a relapse, and that's why you use the drug. You didn't use the drug and have the relapse. And it's a, it seems like a small difference, but it's really about what was going on in their life, and it's really about what caused them to feel unsafe, uncared for, disconnected. Um, and Johan Hari, who most of you probably have read his book or seen his movie, says that the opposite of addiction is not recovery. The opposite of addiction is connection. So that's the kind of work I'm doing. 
To David Smith, first, you've worked in the field of addiction medicine for some time and across a variety of contexts. Can you describe to us what happened in the treatment of addiction 40, 50 years ago when you started and address where we are now in the current state of the opioid crisis? I'm in recovery myself. I love the spirituality of the 12-step movement. And we're going to attend one of your sessions. So I'm down there, right, Chris? So you can get me addressed. What I, I wanted to use my limited amount of time on is I am at the opposite end of the spectrum from Stephen, which is the brain, brain chemistry. But if you look, listen to what he says and then look at the enormous advances in the brain chemistry, I think I will be able to give you a paradigm for understanding it. It's the forefront of medicine and science now. And I'm just going to give you a brief overview. I'll give this in more detail to my patients tomorrow. You have, first of all, the white matter, the prefrontal cortex. What we're talking to now, that's the spiritual center. That is layered onto the primitive gray matter that regulates food, sex, sleep, but they've now discovered, it's like astronomy, they've now discovered a third platform. It's dark matter. And that is the genetic platform. Every thought, mood, and emotion has a chemical reaction in the brain. So we're now learning that there is a biological basis to addiction, to depression, to psychosis, and if you think about it, what the young people are doing today with high doses of opiates, potent forms of marijuana, high doses of speed, all the things that Stephen talked about, is they're putting a deep electrode probe into their, their, their gray matter and altering the neurochemistry of that. Now, the whole lecture in and of itself, I won't elaborate on it other than to say it is also teaching us something about why acupuncture works. Remember, Western medicine doesn't understand acupuncture. The only reason I understand it is that uh, acupuncture came to our clinic in uh, the 70s with the Bill Pone, and then mm -hmm. a bright young woman here devoted to the free clinic movement came along, and then I wiped out my knees with basketball and skiing, and she came over, and it works. The pain's gone. I can exercise. Not as good as I used to, but I can exercise now. So you have to experience it to believe it. So I've started to study why acupuncture works. <laughs> you didn't tell me that. <laughs> and if you think about it, for example, there are more receptors outside the brain throughout the body than there are inside the brain. And acupuncture, I believe, penetrates down into the gray matter and possibly, we won't, just beginning to study the gray matter, it's kind of like, I mean, the black matter, it's like discovering a black hole in the universe, just beginning to study it. But there's a phenomenon now being studied in science called epigenetics, that uh, external forces can alter genetic transmission. In the brain. They found this out with uh, meditation uh, and stroke victims. Very simply stated, happy thoughts create happy molecules. And to create happy molecules, it can't be just in the gray matter. It has to get down to the dark matter, where you alter gen genetic transmission. It's my hypothesis. I don't believe it will be proven in our lifetime, is that acupuncture works. It works in part because it penetrates the gray matter, and I also believe that it gets into the, the, the uh, uh, dark matter. So some people, mostly in this room, are motivated by Buddhist uh, meditations. The world is not. The world is motivated by does it work and does it save money? And if we can demonstrate that brain science and reduction of relapse can reduce uh, 
you know, ER admissions and medicalization, we will have major impact. If we don't do something about the current drug epidemic, it will bankrupt the medical system with all the mm -hmm. diseases that it produces. Uh, Ra, you've been a leading clinician for a number of integrative and non-pharmacological pain studies and are currently out onboarding as the first acupuncturist in integrated pediatric pain and palliative care at UCSF. How did you make this happen, and how did you get your foot in the door at UCSF as an acupuncturist? I, I love how exciting it is to be part of the acupuncture profession in the U.S. right now, and especially in this area. And I think we're doing some of the most progressive work. I'm excited to see what comes with the CIS-ACTCM merger as well, and I'm really interested in the integration of those modalities. Our profession is changing so quickly. I mean, how long have we been here? 30 years, 35 years? I mean, really only had the right to practice since the late 70s in this state, um, or mid-70s. So, all right, so 40 years. It's not that long. And so it makes it really dynamic. We're kind of like Jingwell points of our profession. It's the, the cheese very dynamic and shifting. And um, I think our generation, the generations before us fought for the right to practice here and for a practice act. And we're still trying to do that in all 50 states. What I want to say is that we ha all have to be to some degree pioneers and have to find that piece where we kick down the door a little bit. Sometimes I liken it to, for those of you that are older, like the Kool-Aid guy in the commercial that kicks down the wall and says, Kool-Aid, you know? Um, we kind of have to do a little bit of that right now because I think it's on us to say, hey, we have something amazing. We are a gift. And we're ready and we're trained and we have tools that, that you need that we can do together to help patients. But it's on us to some degree. And so for years, you know, like I was saying, the generations fought for the right to do this legally. The next generation fought for the right to have access to education. And our generation, to some degree, we're facing high student loans in exchange for the opportunity of that education compared to what we can walk out of guaranteed employment with. But the bigger challenge that I think our profession faces is how do we integrate our medicine into this country and basically create a new brand in some ways of, of acupuncture, of American acupuncture medicine? How do we integrate without assimilating? How do we learn enough biomedical language that we can communicate across the table without losing the poetic nature of our medicine that is inherent to the efficacy of it? So we need more studies that are comparative studies, where you have standard of care plus our intervention versus just standard of care. And that opens up so much freedom for us to really study our medicine. First of all, it lets us individualize the treatments to some degree. Now, we have to have some kind of standardization. It is research, after all. But we need to have flexibility in how we do that, because if we're just saying, you have this, you get these three points, then we all know we're not really doing our medicine. So the only funder that's come through that would support something like this is a relatively new association created under the Obama administration called PCORI, the People-Centered Outcome Research Institute. And they care about subjective data. And they're open to comparative studies. These studies are going to change things for us because we've had our hands tied re up till now in the world of research by not having enough financial support for comparative studies um, and for studies that really bring our medicine in its integrity to the table. Um, so, going back to the Kool-Aid guy, now I'm kind of the Kool-Aid guy anyway, I'm loud and boisterous, but the reason I think this is important is, um, how did I get into UCSF? A few years ago there was not much acupuncture at UCSF, there's outpatient at the Osher Center. But what I did is, years ago, and you guys, for UCIS people, some of you may know Dr. Helge Osterholt, he teaches in the East-West program here, you may not know him, and he worked at UCSF for a while, he's a graduate of the East-West doctoral program at CIS, and one day he said to me, hey, you, you teach Qigong. I've been a martial artist forever. He said, will you come in for a retreat we're doing for the nurses and doctors and teach Qigong um, at the, um, the armory or wherever it was? And I said, sure. I mean, the chance to have the ear and time and voice of, of these medical professionals excited me. So I came in, I taught Qigong, and I said, you know, it'd be super cool. Let's just set up a little community acupuncture clinic. We'll set up some chairs over there. I'll bring in some practitioners. And I got the clinic director from AMC to do it with me. Well, the first time we did it, there were about 60 people at this retreat. We had six people come for acupuncture that day. And one of the uh, interns was like, oh, only six. I was like, you don't understand. The, of those six people, five of them had never had acupuncture before. I said, we're planting seeds here. This was about five years ago. The next time they did that retreat, they asked us to come in. Out of 60, we had 52 sign up. 
And the word had spread, hey, that's cool, that's cool. And out of that 52, about 45 of them had never had acupuncture before. So after that happened, I went back to him. I said, you know, it'd be super cool, now that we know that your staff really likes this, is let's do this every week. And I set up an externship from my college um, to deliver community-style acupuncture treatments to the staff at UCSF. And I thought, this is the Trojan horse. You know why? Because when you try to talk about acupuncture with people, it's hard to unpack it. It's hard to find the words for it. We can say, it works. It, there's this study, there's that. But there is nothing that sells this medicine like the needle itself and the experience of getting it. As soon as someone gets this medicine, 95, 98% of the people say, wow, that it, it touches some part of us that is perhaps beyond words. Maybe it's the dark matter of the brain that it's connecting to. It's this deep place. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just thought, let me create some way to let this medicine sell itself in the hospital. And then all these people that are experiencing their own healing from it will become natural advocates. So it was the idea of instead of being an external invasion, we want to treat your patients. Let us in. Let us in. Banging the down the doors. I thought, let's be a gene tonic. Let's, because that's what we are. Let's come in and tonify the whole hospital and support them that way and lift everyone up. Because if we're supporting the staff, we're supporting every person that that staff is go. seeing. Wow. So, yeah, great. thanks for, yeah. So, yeah. there'll be more. There'll be more. So, isn't that ex inspiring for all of us to have great ideas about what tra Trojan horse will you come up with to get into your project? That's great. So, Dr. Tierney. You've worked in the field of psychotherapy and mindfulness practice and addiction recovery. What do you feel is the unique role of mental health providers in this discussion of opioid crisis and addiction? When we work with mental health folks, with addiction folks, one of the things we struggle with all the time is how do we get to that basic information about what we're working with? And so some of the standard ways that mental health providers and physicians um, do that is there are some 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 question um, um, lists that you've seen. Um, so one of them, for instance, in alcohol was put out by, is John, by Johns Hopkins. It still gets used. The more common one is the Michigan test, which is 10 questions. But the questions all ask things like, how much do you drink? Or if it's the drug one, how much? How often do you use drugs? Do you use them in the morning? Have you ever used them alone? Do you use them with something called your lower companions? Um, and, and those kind of questions. And so what that gives you um, how much do you drink with the difference between the amounts that a man or a woman would drink? Um, so those questions might give you some data, and hopefully if you're a skilled practitioner, um, they would lead to a conversation. Um, that that 20-question um, thing from Johns Hopkins often gets out, is out in the lobby of medical centers <clears throat> or, or uh, clinics so that people can take a look at it and begin to think. Well, the problem is if you answer those questions and it, you answer one yes, I wish we had a copy of it here, um, because again, you'd all be joining the club. If you answer one yes, you probably have a problem. Two yes, you have a problem. Three, um, you are indeed an addict. So um, three questions, and some of them are, did, did you ever drink in the morning? Well, I said, have you ever been to Provincetown? Or, or you know, so, <laughs> of course people drink in the morning. Um, so, so that's the issue. And so on a very practical level, when we teach the program, um, that I created here is called the Community Mental Health Program. It's a social justice model. And so what I said to people, um, and I said it when I was teaching at ACTCM as well, is that you get some nice person before the client gets to you often has filled out a questionnaire. Oftentimes it's a really wonderful person at a front desk, or it's a yellow piece of paper on a clipboard and you have it over in the corner. So my suggestion is when that comes to you before the client walks in, um, take that and put it in the top desk drawer and don't look at it. And there are four questions um, that sum up how I think we ought to be working um, with patients. And those questions, first question is, who are you? Um, I was at a clinic recently, and uh, they were assigning the staff for that morning, and they said, you have an addict in curtain one, and you have diabetes in curtain three. Uh. <laughs> and I said, um, we need to have a little staff meeting now. Um, so here's the deal is, when we talk about people feeling not connected as part of what moves the brain um, to respond the way it does, um, you're in a room with somebody who has a relationship with substances or behaviors that they are finding troubling enough to come to see you. That's the news. So there's a challenge going on in their life. But what is the challenge? So they don't want to know that they're an addict, an alcoholic, a uh, chronic relapser in the first few minutes. They want to know that you hear them, right? 
they want to know what you that you hear what they're talking about. And so it's really important to have a chance for that person to say, you know, we ask a better question, which is, what brings you here today? But because our system is set up as symptom management mostly, people will give you their, you know, especially with WebMD and Dr. Phil, they'll tell you what's wrong with them because they know. Um, but what you really want to know is who are you? Who are you and what brought you here? The good news is they have a troubled relationship with substances or process addictions, and they're in your office talking to you. And we know from research um, that it doesn't matter if they were mandated to be there. If they came on their own, they're there. And so that's an important thing. So first question is, who are you? Second question that I work into the conversation is, what happened to you? I have a firm belief that human beings um, have the capacity and desire to take care of themselves and to be healthy. So something happened. And as Gabor Mate and um, Bessel van der Kirk say, that if you scratch the surface of almost any addict, you will find untreated trauma, you will find untreated depression, and you will find a lack of a spiritual connection. It doesn't have to be a specific one, but a lack. And so something happened to this person that's sitting in your office um, that has caused them to have this um, this um, uh, unskilled relationship or, or, or uh, maladaptive relationship, if you will, with the substance, right? Because if you go back to what I said earlier, we use substances um, for healing, soothing, and pleasure. And so um, most of us have probably had a glass of wine or a drink, right? Most of us have perhaps done some other things, and most of us have eaten, most of you, because we raised our hand, have eaten food that we know we shouldn't eat, but we're eating it anyway because in the moment it takes care of some need that we have. So what we want to find out is at what point did that become maladaptive rather than adaptive, and you do that by talking to people about what was going on in your life. When you used um, um, opioids for the first time, what were you trying to do? Did it work? When did it stop working? What did you do about that? And that gives you some um, information that you can really work with. So who are you? What happened to you? Third question is who's got your back? <clears throat> because I don't know anybody in all the years I've been doing this work um, that actually managed to get um, clean or sober or to develop a harm reduction plan, an effective harm reduction plan for themselves, um, they did it by themselves. And so that's <clears throat> one of the things that's wonderful about what we're doing here is we are forming uh, support groups. We have an acupuncturist and a psychologist and a nurse and a peer, and, and all we're all together. So one of the things that I think is when you ask people to come to your office, um, who has your back? One of the common answers, if you've ever asked it, for some people, particularly troubled um, transition age youth and teenagers, is nobody. Nobody. I wouldn't be living on the street if somebody had my back. And so one of the gifts that we get to do as healthcare providers, who are first of all human beings, is to say, well, who do you turn to when things are going really well? Who do you turn to when things are going really bad? And if the answer to that is actually nobody, that gives you something that you can begin to work on in terms of getting them into a peer support group, in terms of helping them to remember good times that they've had with a friend or family member and to rebuild those relationships. Because in the process of getting clean and sober, they are giving up, in many cases, the one thing that has been there to support them when they needed to be healed, held, or soothed, and giving that up. So one of the things that we work with is the grieving process of giving up that one steady thing. So asking them who has their back and, and building the networks of support that they need from us and from their friends or family or who's ever safe um, becomes really important. And then the final question is, what changes do you want to make? And ask in the context of what changes can you tolerate right now? Because as David said, there's things going on physically and with the brain and with the environment and, and epigenetics. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So those are just four questions. Ask them your own way. Don't ask them the way I said. Um, but it's really important for us. Um, most of us have sheets we have to fill out for the state or the insurance company or the clinic. Um, and that's, that's important for research reasons and important for billing reasons. Um, but I really think there's time to do that in a way that first says, I'm a human being in this, in this world who wants to hear what you have to say. And we're going to develop a treatment plan together based on what's important to you. Yeah. Wise words for us during our intake and giving us tools without being a psychotherapist. Here's the tools we can use. Wonderful. Just a human being. Just a human being, right. So now we have some general questions. 
Um, what do you feel as healthcare providers, providers, acupuncturists, et cetera, can we all do as a professional group to prioritize patient care in the midst of this epidemic? One of the things that I see uh, that I think is becoming more so with the new doctoral programs, and I really credit ACOM for the guidelines they set up for the new transitional doctorates and the DACM programs, because um, I, there's a lot more focus on uh, integrating interprofessional communication, and uh, and what I think also that we need to develop more of is this um, uh, integrative medical terminology. So we've studied Western medical terminology, we've studied Chinese medicine terminology. So what are those bridges between our professions? And, and this is what I was saying again, is how do we translate it? How do we talk about it and not lose ourselves in the nature? We don't want to reduce acupuncture medicine to just being about the nervous system, even though we know there's a component to that. We don't want it just to be about the release of endogenous um, opioids in the body, because it's more than that. And I also believe that a lot of the things that are elusive about the efficacy of Chinese medicine will reveal itself more and more, actually, as we gain technological advances. I'm actually really interested at where nanotechnology and advanced imaging takes us. And I'll give you a, just a quick example. UCSF, about a year ago, found through a lung study that stem cells were being made in the lung. And that led to the idea that, oh, the lungs have a role in blood creation which was revolutionary for Western medicine. And um, this is something, you know, we've for long said that the zong chi of the chest is, is an inherent part of blood creation. And um, so when a study like that happens, and I'm always looking at studies more and more in my life has become research, and I really love the language of it. When I see a study like that, I think, wow, well, this is a perfect example for us to say, and I wrote a paper about this that I shared at UCSF, hey, this is something we've thought for a long time. And so I don't just want that research to validate us and, and have us say, you know, see, we told you so, because I think we can all play nice. Um, but I think it could be a, this dynamic conversation where we go back to them and say, okay, now that you guys are on the page with the lungs having a role in blood creation, what do you think the heart does? Because we think that it's made in the heart. So let's talk about the endocrine function of the heart in the, in the creation of blood or whatever that is. And, yeah. And, That's and, right. and we can, you know, we also believe the stomach and, and so it's, it's this idea of how, how do we do this? And I actually have this idea of having more conferences and more classes like this together where we, the topic appeals to multiple different practitioners and we create more of that interprofessional communication. Because I think a lot of people uh, do think of us as just pain managers and that's definitely the open door for us right now. There's a lot of grants for the opioid crisis and um, we can come in and be an answer to that. And then while we're there, it's say, and look at all this other amazing stuff we do at the same time while we're treating your pain. Um, so that's an opportunity for us. So if pain is the open door, let's walk through it and let's show them Oz on the other side of what Chinese medicine can be. Um, but I think we need to work on this language. And I want to do more of this in doctoral programs with schools and in meetings that we have. How do we communicate our medicine and not belittle it and also speak a language that is shared? Thank you. I'm dying to ask Stephen some questions. Go ahead. And I'm formulating oh, research it. hypotheses and brain chemistry, but that's not the question. Yeah. <laughs> what can we do? I am part of the upstream as past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. We met with Congress. We were factors in getting this bill passed. There is a flood of money coming down your way. None of it is motivated by these spiritual discussions here. Mm -hmm. None of it. What is motivated is the overdose death rate in the red states. Mm -hmm. Surgeon General's report uh, said that we are fighting World War II with the Coast Guard. I can't tell you what to do with your careers other than to say I'm highly motivated to make acupuncture integrated into the mainstream medicine and get it paid for. To do that, you must demonstrate that you're part of the workforce that will respond to the opiate epidemic. Evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And that's where the research hypotheses come in. Uh, for example, 
opiate sparing. You get opiates for pain, take acupuncture, pain goes down. But you have to prove your case. I mean, right. I, I'm here not for proof. I'm here for spiritual enhancement, hearing to these dynamic speakers speak. That doesn't work out there. Therefore, right. you have to come up with research hypotheses that right. work. Right. So, for example, I will share with you similar areas. It's called therapeutic engagement. If you just listen to what Stephen said, he described therapeutic engagement. There is a neurobiology to the therapeutic engagement. There's an oxytocin response. That's the ultimate and 12-step work, which is service. Mm -hmm. That actually produces a chemical reaction in the gray matter. So, um, you look at an acupuncture experiment. You look at the acupuncture. And you look at sham. But you don't evaluate the therapeutic engagement of Pam Olton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the design has to include a component of therapeutic engagement to challenge hypotheses. Just listen to what Stephen said. The first questions he asked were not technical questions. They were therapeutic engagement questions. And right. I was visualizing the right. brains of these people. I'm sorry, Stephen. You think of the world, I think of their brains. And I could see a chemical reaction going on in your brain. Belief is knowledge plus role model. Mm -hmm. You can give all the knowledge you want, but evidence is shown you have to have a role model. The role model has to be somebody you believe in that cares for you or also been the same path that you've done. So I think when you design these experiments, uh, you work on that the sham acupuncture got you into the JMA, but that's we've got to be way more creative than that out of this school. Therefore, I believe in you design your experiments and demonstrate outcome. A, you have to have a, a more uh, broader picture of what control group is and include in that therapeutic engagement. And then you have to have specific outcome measures. Uh, I know the outcome measures that we're talking about is that they've increased ER admissions, is it increased engagement in the world or whatever. Uh, I will just add that uh, when we did our four years of acupuncture for HIV grant that we did 2004 to 2008 from the AIDS office, the only real outcome we got from that was that um, a high percentage of, of men who came in for acupuncture only ended up engaging with the Western medical doctors and submitting to blood testing and getting on their HIV meds. That's that was a great outcome, yeah. and that I, I learned so much about that because these were people who didn't want to come into the building and see a Western doctor. They wanted acupuncture. Well, have your students realize yeah. that if you come yeah. in... That model of using acupuncture as a funnel to getting them into treatment into counseling, into AA meetings, into psychiatric evaluation, whatever it takes is a great funnel. And those are outcome measures that right. can be measured. For mm -hmm. example, if you see Pam and get your acupuncture and she says go in and uh, see the doctor and get your treatment for diabetes, well I don't like doctors, well Pam told me to do it, you go in there and you get your diabetic medication, your blood sugar goes down, you have less TO acidosis, you have less uh, medical complications, and then you can cost that out. That's, that's what our nurses are working out. In other words, a reduction of diabetic crisis because you've engaged the medical system, which started with therapeutic engagement of acupuncture, can be translated into dollars. And that's what's going to sell it, which is making acupuncture... I mean, what gets us into this room is what Ron Steven says. That's not going to make it in the real world. You've got to have a design. You've got to have look like you're part of the workforce, and you have to have measurable outcome measures that demonstrate mm -hmm. that you not only help people, help suffering, but you decrease the cost. And I think you have all the tools to do that. You just haven't, um, I guess, learned from old-timers like me that are part of that 
world that we don't like and determine what moves them. And I can tell you, we move that world. We move the world because, uh, and this, this big policy work, we moved it because we got them to accept that addiction was a brain disease, not a moral failing. We got them to accept that you can treat addiction and save money. And we got them to accept that it wasn't just blue states like San Francisco that it happened to. The biggest epidemic where, where you acupuncturists are needed the most is in Kentucky, West Virginia. That's part of the problem, workforce development. The mm-hmm. resources are in this area. Mm-hmm. And what we're working on with our, our group uh, is telemedicine. I don't know how you're going to do that. But <laughs> if you think of this, this, is, this would be a hub and there's spokes out. I'm sure there's people like you out into these areas of the people that need it because there's a direct overdose death rate where the fewer resources there are, the more medical consequences there are. And of course, how you do that comes out of a training center. But you've got to prove your case first. Thank you, David. We have some other questions, and we're running out of time. We want to give the audience some time. Um, I think that we, unless, I'm just going to go through these and say, I think that we talked quite a bit about the role trauma plays in motivating or exacerbating the opioid crisis. Um, is there anything else that any of us would want to add to the idea of trauma? Did we say enough for any, any I think we probably said enough to answer questions, but yeah. but I did want to say briefly, following up on what David said, that, yeah. that for those of you that are really interested, which is everybody that's here, or might have a paper to write or whatever, um, the definition that we used to use um, in the diagnostic DSM um, referred to substance use disorder as a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to significant impairment and distress. And so we don't, by and large, use that anymore for a whole bunch of reasons about that book, but also because it doesn't necessarily lead to significant impairment and distress, the significant impairment and distress come first. And so that's not what I want you to read, just know that. What I want you to do is Google tonight when you get home the American Society of Addiction Medicines, which I think David was a mastermind of, and, and, got, and, it's, and it's brilliant because it talks about the brain and it talks about the environment, it talks about the other things, and it's on one small page. So if you read that a couple of times, when you're working with your clients, you're not counting um, things that, that need to be counted for research, etc. And then that's the final thing I would say is that all of us are saying the same thing. We know we need numbers. Um, the program that David referred to, the Needle Exchange Program in San Francisco, I was at the health department at the time and coordinated those programs. The code name for the Needle Exchange Program on the streets of San Francisco was Socks and Sandwiches. So when those Needle Exchange groups went out in the evening, um, they did. They had all that equipment, um, and there were nurses volunteering, social workers volunteering, and a couple of acupuncturists volunteering, physicians volunteering, so that people came, they could get clean needles, um, and they could get clean socks and some sandwiches. Um, and when they left, they had had that sort of trusting relationship that then they would say, well, where do you practice? Where can I come see you? Um, now that I've gotten to trust you a little bit, where can I come see you? So be as absolutely creative as you can be. Think about what you'd like if you were feeling isolated and not well and wanted some help. Think about what would be important to you when you go to encounter and then we do have to, as my two colleagues said, back that up with research because none of that would have happened, um, sandwiches, socks, needle exchange, or, or the clinics, um, unless we had CDC funding. And if any of you work for CDC, you know that that takes over your life with paperwork. Mm-hmm. And the results are important because that's where the funding comes from. So we all might have things we prefer, direct patient care research. Um, well, what's important is that we all work together um, and help the researchers design the research so that it's really humane. The news flash that I thought I would just talk about for a second is, what do you all think about the uh, safe injection site and that was just not signed into law by our governor? Anybody want to comment on the well, idea I'll, of safe I'll, injection sites? I'll start yeah. there. Uh, of course, every time Stephen talks, I'm all sorts of things coming in my mind. Right. But I'll try to stay focused on that. We're making great <laughs> friends today on this panel, yeah. Um, you look at broad harm reduction, nobody will recover if they're dead. 
that, that's a basic scientific principle. Right. You can't do anything if you're dead. And therefore, harm reduction is a continuum to keep people alive while they move along this this train. I, I just, I guess the thing I want to say, Stephen, that at the needle exchange, we had people that had what you talked about, and then they said, gee, there's a better way. And I have people now that are in 12-step recovery that said I got started with needle exchange because they treated me as a human being. I just went to their uh, anniversary. So needle exchange is not an end in and of itself. It's a continuum of care of which you engage them where they're at. Uh, Governor Brown, I, I know him, I like him. He really didn't get it. In other words, he said you have to mandate treatment before you do needle exchange. It goes the other way. You engage the person as a human being, and uh, then you move them along towards recovery. So I was very disappointed. We're in the midst of a crisis. We need all hands on deck. And we're battling even people that should know better. Jerry Brown is is a smart guy. Yet he got advised of some very inaccurate science. So I hope what will happen is that you will include your belief system and with scientific basis and try to look at the facts, look at the purpose, every time you reduce a needle abscess. I have two patients in the hospital now that have wiped out their heart valves with IBWs. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Leading cause of medical costs at San Francisco General are medical complications of needle abscesses. We're in the midst of an epidemic Every time we reduce one of those, however we do it, then it saves the medical system money. And by the way, in the end of that continuum of care, a certain number will want to get into recovery. So th that's my position. I think that's a, a great way to stop the panel and open up the floor to people who have questions for any of our panelists. First off, thank you so much. This has been very interesting, and um, so seeing acupuncture become something in our healthcare field is uh, exciting in that I'm hoping that massage can in some way gain in uh, uh, being a reputable form of, uh, of healthcare as well. And I just was curious if you had any opinions or feelings on that, if you think that we'll ever be able to get to the same place in terms of respectability. So therapeutic touch has a huge role to play. The IP3 team, Integrative Pediatric Pain and Palliative Care team that I'm joining at UCSF, has massage therapists on it at this time. And so I hope to continue growing more of that because my roots are there as well. Can you do the Trojan horse for your group? Because more data will create jobs. People who do therapeutic touch for patients for free are angels, but they're never paid enough and they get burned out and they need to be paid in, in the public sector. I've been working in the public sector for years, and all of us acupuncturists in the public health sector are way underpaid. So we need more data. We need to create jobs. Who's going to pay for all of your people out there in the streets? I, I wish it would happen tomorrow. Andy, had his hand up. You can go to a hospital administrator and say, we could save you, uh, you know, fewer infections. Few, but you're also saying we're taking business away from you. It's market share. You know, I love your example of the, the Kool-Aid man. Because if you come in and say, we can help, what they're hearing is, you can take our <laughs> work away from us. You know, if, if, it's like if the cure of cancer suddenly, well, many cures are there, it's fought. So we have to be a lot sneakier about how we, we present our... If you live in a world of fake news and... Fiscally motivated, like, you know, there's a lot of people who don't want the opiate epidemic solved. The drug dealers don't. Mm -hmm. uh, the DEA doesn't. A uh, lot of people don't want it solved. We do. Now, why does these laws get passed? Because people are dying. HIV, needle abscesses, the old ways have stopped working. 
So now we want to open up the new ways. So the young lady asked about massage. Her agenda is to advance massage into the medical system. I can assure you that you have our support and that support will not accomplish that goal other than to motivate people and train. What will, what will advance it is that you develop studies that show that massage is therapeutic. The good news about the opiate epidemic, it's opened the door to the work that you're saying. There's a study going on now through the National Institute of Drug Abuse that is following what you have to do is prospective studies. They're taking individuals that had addiction, they follow them, what caused them to relapse, what caused them to do this. They're doing brain imaging, they're doing things that look at the cortisol surges, and they're looking at interventions that help reduce that. And they're funding that. A study that I actually came across last night about acupuncture and hypnotherapy being delivered together and being more than the sum of its parts. They looked at acupuncture alone, hypnotherapy alone, standard of care, and then acupuncture plus hypnotherapy. When I sit here at CIS and ACTCM, I think, wow, I'd love to see a research study maybe come out of that with UCSF patients. Um, you know, when we're looking at integrative care, merging these modalities, it's such a natural synergy. So I'm really excited to see what develops at this very institution. You know, when we're receiving these patients, you know, I'm, un, you know, they're definitely patient-centered. You want to meet them where they're at, meet their goals, meet. But my problem is, is that we have a limited amount of sessions to work with the patient. How do we keep them motivated? You know, what is a typical timeline for someone who wants to wean? Um, I do come from the harm reduction model. I, I used to be a risk reduction counselor here in San Francisco. But it's, we're getting so many different, I mean, patients were on oxycodone for 10 years. What is my expectation as an acupuncturist to help them shift gear? Like, is it, am I being successful if it's 5% change? And then we can't sustain that 5%. So my, I guess it's a, I'm processing my question as I'm speaking, but I, I'm wanting to learn more about as in your professions, how do you frame a patient? Like, how do we create smarter goals for them and as to be good clinicians as well and not over promise. Look at the data in the introductory remark. We're in the middle of a hurricane. It is overwhelming. We have to figure out what our role in that is and how to stay in it. What has kept me in it? I've been practicing addiction medicine basically since 1965 and what keeps me in it is recovery. I've assessed a lot of people from their overdoses, you know, saved some lives, but what keeps me in is to see people recover. 5%, just think about it, 5% has saved your community a very large amount of money, and also you can serve as a role model in your community for sticking to it. If you, uh, it's very easy to get discouraged in this. I mean, that's why I find this, uh, uh, you know, energizing. But you have to pick your role, decide what you want to do, what your focus is. Don't get discouraged by 5%. Uh, you can either look at it, you know, like spiritually, I help these people, or you can look at it socially, economically, the amount of money it saves the system. Um, but I think that the, the issues are so overwhelming, it's easy to get discouraged. Studies and uh, measurement are the things that need to be done. That's where the money's coming from. Or this latest series of questions, how can I not get discouraged? Measurement is not going to help you from getting discouraged. Uh, how can I stay in this field? I actually... Stephen did more for me than anything, any of the questions about why I'm here. In other words, is this a spiritual pursuit? At the, I'm 80. Right now it is. Your patients need to have therapists and other, other allies. And depending on their model of payment, they may not be able to get all that stuff, which is our frustration. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Maybe somebody else is I think this. one of the things to take home with you is that perfection is the enemy of good care. Right. 
We're trying to be perfect, <laughs> trying to do it exactly. Right. And when you say, what is good care? I'm reminded when they were um, thinking about pornography, Justice Grandi said, can't really define it, but I know it when I see it. And so that has to come from your heart and your professional practice and your professional organization. What is good enough? 5%, frankly, sounds really good to me if you're accomplishing that. So if you're doing 5% helping people come off of those particular medications and on to an integrated treatment plan, um, uh, we'll give you a little award on your way out for the 5%. All right. Before we end, Dr. Valerie Harper will come up and address us on behalf of Dr. Uh, Harper is the director of the DAOM program at ACTCM, and she has a few notes to tell us. Okay. Hi. Thank you all for being here. And if, if you're a member of the public just looking for more information, thank you for being here. If you're a practitioner uh, providing health care, thank you for being here.